Hello and welcome to today's Park at Home video worship experience. We are so glad that you have decided to join us today. But really, whenever you're watching, wherever, however you're watching, we are glad that you are watching. Especially if you're new with us. If this is your first time ever tuning in to a Park at Home and being part of Park Church, we are so glad that you're with us. Thank you for joining us. Here at Park Church, we have a Bible reading plan where every day we read one chapter from the New Testament. And this past Friday, we read something that, in my opinion, it captures so perfectly what we're about here at Park Church and what we believe and why we do what we do. It's written by a man named Paul in a letter called 2 Corinthians, there's chapter 5. And he writes in there that it's the love of Christ that urges us on. And I want you to know at home that we are glad that you have joined us because the love of Christ is what urges us on here at Park Church. And then Paul goes on to talk about what we believe. And he said that in Christ, and that is in Jesus, uh, 2,000 years ago, in his, his birth and his life and his teaching, his miracles, his death and his resurrection, in Christ, what God was doing was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses, their, their sins against them. You know what that means? That means that in Christ, God was reconciling you to himself and the person sitting next to you and that friend who you're thinking about and that family member you love and your neighbor down the street and the person you work with. And why we exist as Park Church is to share in that good news with one another and with the world around. To bring that message to, that, to the world out there that God loves so deeply. So if you are tuning in with us for the first time or if you've been tuning in with us for months now, that is what we are about here at Park Church. And that's why we're so glad that you decided to join us today. I wanna tell you about a few things we have going on here. The first is what's happening this Saturday, October 17th at 10 a.m. It's a women's gathering, but rather than me tell you, I'm gonna have one of the women who's organizing it, Darlene, she's gonna share with you. Hey ladies, this is something special just for us. On October 17th, we're gonna have a gathering of encouragement. We're gonna have a mother-daughter team that are from Park Church to share with us. And here's a little taste. How do you feel when someone says to you, you'll get through this? That's encouraging, isn't it? And it should be hopeful, but sometimes the follow-up to that is how? And if so, why don't I feel like it? So we're gonna explore some things, ways that we can get through this, whatever this is. And we're also gonna make a decision to journey together with Jesus and to journey together with one another through this, whatever this is. Thank you, Darlene. Women, we encourage you to be there. Bring a mask, bring a chair, bring a friend. Now, I wanna tell you about what's happening on the very next day, Sunday, October 18th from one to three. We're having an event for all of our kids. It's called Pumpkins, Pumpkins, Pumpkins. It's about pumpkins. Uh, we're going to set up a pumpkin patch where kids can go pick a pumpkin, they can paint pumpkins, and they can have a great time together. We would love it if you brought your kids. Bring some friends, kids. Invite some neighbors. It'll be a great time together. We'll have some socially distant um, snacks and activities, but bring a mask so that everyone is safe, and it'll be a wonderful time just for us to get together and to share in the joy of the season with our kids. The last thing I want to tell you about is what we're doing on Thursdays uh, in order to pray for the space that we're going to move into in the future over at 312 Hands, where we have our outdoor gatherings now. Every Thursday morning at 9 a.m., we invite you to go to 312 Hands, and some people from Park will be there, and we'll walk the grounds there, and we'll walk the neighborhood and pray um, for the work that God will do in and through us when we get to 312. We invite you to do that every Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Now, we know that a lot of us are working or just unable to be there at 9 a.m. And if you can't make it on Thursdays, here's what we invite you to do instead. At 312 p.m., we invite you to, to pray for 312 at 
312. Maybe you could just set an alarm or some kind of reminder on your phone so that every Thursday, just take a moment and pray for um, the mission of God through 312 hands to happen at 312 p.m. We invite you to do that. Now today we're going to kick off a new series called The Donkey, the Elephant, and the Lamb. It's about following Jesus in a politically charged culture. We're talking about politics and religion. What could go wrong? This morning we're going to hear um, about more important than who our president is, is who our king is. And so before we hear about that, we're going to sing about that too. With this new song, it's called, Oh Worship the King. We invite you to sing with us now. Worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Tell of His might, O scene of His grace, O is the light whose canopy His path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain. Stills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail. In thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end. Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Hello, I'm Darlene Eason, and I'm one of the leaders at Park Church, and I'll be leading us in prayer. Now, before I do, I just want to say at the very end of the prayer, and uh, it will become clear when that time is, I'm asking God to have his will be done in our hearts and his will to be done in my heart. And I just wanted to give you a pause here to think about it, um, that we wouldn't just pray the words, but if you would like to pray that prayer from your heart as I continue to the end of the prayer, um, you can pray that from your your heart. And if not, I'm not trying to trick you into um, asking God for his will in your heart. That's something only you can do. So um, shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, you are worthy of all our praise and adoration. You are magnificent and your creation praises you day in and day out. Open our mouths to declare you alone are perfectly great, good, glorious, and gracious. You are worthy of our praise and adoration. We can safely trust in your good heart and intentions for us. The thoughts you think toward us, the plans you have for us, and the works you have designed for us are all good. Thank you for including us in your redemptive plan by inviting us to receive new life in Christ. You are the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you for being faithful. We can rest in you securely. Help us to do so, to trust you, to humbly submit to you, to take you at your word, 
to honor your word and to live it. Thank you by your Holy Spirit that we can live a victorious life no longer conformed to the pattern of this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds by your word. We have the privilege and pleasure to walk in peace, love, and joy, that of your kingdom, right here, right now. Bring our hearts and minds in alignment with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus, you came not only to give us a glimpse of your kingdom, but to set things in motion for your kingdom on earth. So we pray for that today. We pray for your kingdom to come and for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be done in Park Church, in this neighborhood, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in Monmouth County, and in our surrounding counties. Your kingdom come and your will be done throughout New Jersey and the surrounding states, in all of our states, in the United States, and throughout the world. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Help us to realize that by your design, we are the only ones who can allow your kingdom to come and your will to be done in the realm of our own heart. So we pause for a moment here and now and welcome you to our life and ask you to do a work in our hearts that only you can do. I welcome you to do a work in my heart. I welcome you now. Do that work that only you can do. Your kingdom come and your will be done in my heart today, I pray. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Good morning. Uh, welcome to another edition of Park at Home. My name is Michael Carlson. I'm the lead pastor here at Park Church, and I'm so glad to have you with us. Uh, this morning, we are kicking off a new teaching series called The Donkey, the Elephant, and the Lamb, Following Jesus in a Politically Charged Culture. Which means, yes, we are breaking that that rule that you may have heard before, you know, don't talk about politics and religion. We're doing both. Uh, and and let, me, let me begin on the outset by putting you at ease. I, I'm then going to make you uncomfortable. But let me first just put you at ease by, by saying and clarifying a couple things. Throughout this series, uh, Park Church will not be endorsing a candidate. Uh, Park Church will not be endorsing uh, any political party. Uh, in fact, throughout this series, we, we won't even be telling you how we think you should vote on particular issues. There may be issues that come up throughout the series, but that's, that's not the purpose of this series. The purpose of this series, and this is where, where hopefully it makes you a little uncomfortable, is is something actually much more subversive. The purpose of this series is to hold up Jesus and, and his vision of the kingdom of God in such a way that, that actually enables us to be transformed at the deepest levels of who we are. Because if the center of the Christian faith is this announcement that Jesus is Lord, that through him God is rescuing and renewing the world, then what this means is that Jesus is Lord over every area of our lives, including the ways that we think about and engage with politics. And so we, we have to talk about this. It would be artificial not to, for there to be one aspect of life that we say, you know what, this is off limits. Everything else we'll talk about because Jesus cares about all of this, but not, not this piece here. 
And, and so, to, to begin this series, uh, I'd, I'd like to read a, just a, a story from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. And this, this story will, will introduce us to this series. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he, abro- as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So, so our story begins with Jesus slowly making his way to Jerusalem, the capital city. Now, one of the things that's important to be aware of when reflecting on this story is that Jesus lived in a politically charged cultural moment. The the looming cloud of Roman rule overshadowed the politics of Jesus' day. You could not understand things that were going on in Jesus' day without understanding the reality of Rome. See, roughly 90 years before Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, uh, someone else named Pompey rode into Jerusalem and conquered the city. And, And since that time... Jerusalem and Israel was under, had been under, Roman rule. Now, under Rome, you had then many different Jewish sects uh, or parties that arose. And so you had the Roman rule, but then among the Jewish people, the the question loomed of we know that, that Rome's presence here is not the way it's supposed to be. We long for and wait for a time when God's kingdom will come, when God's kingdom will once again be established and and the kingdom, the empire of Rome, is a thing of the past. And, And yet, the answer to the question, how would God's kingdom come, differed greatly among the Jewish people. And there arose these different philosophies, these different parties, we might say, that all had their own answer to the question. And so you had the Sadducees, for example. These were the the urban, sophisticated elites. These uh, Sadducees represented the aristocracy. They they ran the temple. They, They believed that the kingdom of God would come by simply tolerating the presence of the Romans. They were the ones who wanted to keep the peace, not make peace. That's a very different thing. They wanted to keep the peace because, after all, they were benefiting from Rome's presence. So the Sadducees advocated toleration, status quo. Then you had the Pharisees who believed that God's kingdom would come through personal holiness by strict and rigid adherence to God's law, but not only God's law, but the oral tradition, the, the, tra- the, the tradition of the elders, this extra layer of rules and regulations that over the years had been laid on top of God's law. And this, 
this is how God's kingdom would come. One day, God would come and bring his judgment. And, and for all of those who were obedient enough, who adhered to God's law enough, to the righteous, God would reward. And to all the rest, he would punish. And so the Pharisees advocated for strict and rigid adherence, particularly to external rules and regulations. Then you had the zealots. The zealots were the, the violent revolutionaries. God's kingdom, according to the zealots, would come when God's people took up swords and drove the Romans out. Violent coercion was the modus operandi, the MO, according to the zealots, of how God's kingdom would come. And then you had the Essenes. The Essenes were another group, and we don't hear about them in the New Testament because they believed that God's kingdom would come when they had attained a certain level of purity. In fact, they were so extreme, they withdrew from the city and lived in the desert. And, and they, they put the Pharisees to shame when it came to how strict and legalistic they were. And again, we don't hear about them in the New Testament because they withdrew. They lived on their own in the desert. And so how would the kingdom of God come? Through withdrawal and purity. Disengagement from society. And then under all of these different factions and parties, you have the masses, the majority. Roughly 90% of the people of Israel who, who were poor uh, and couldn't be squarely fit into any of these one categories, although most were probably sympathetic to the Pharisees, some maybe the zealots. And so you can begin to see how complicated and politically charged this environment into which Jesus was writing was at this time. Rome was there, they were in charge, everyone hated it, and everyone had different ideas about how God's kingdom would come. Now, at this point, it's worth, I think, pausing and recognizing that like, like Jesus at, in his day and age, we too live in a politically charged culture. I hope what I'm saying is not a shock or surprising to you. I mean, think about this. We live in an election year right now, 2020, and it's been quite a year. Uh, this year has seen a global pandemic, right, disrupting pretty much our entire way of life. This year has seen national unrest due to increased awareness of racial injustice. This year has seen fires that have ravaged the west coast of our country. The largest wildfire season ever recorded in modern history, the state of California. I could keep going. Uh, I could mention the murder hornets on top of everything else. And if you don't know what murder hornets is, maybe I'm just particularly sensitive to it because they, they invaded my hometown, my, my area, the Pacific Northwest. If you don't know what they are, you should look them up. Uh, and yet all of these things, maybe except for the murder hornets, would be bad enough on their own. And yet because we find ourselves in this politically charged time, it's as if these things have, have only exacerbated the anxiety in our culture. They've only, they've only increasingly polarized uh, an, an already polarized political climate. And I, I don't know how you, how you find yourself relating to all of these things that are going on, relating to the, uh, this, this political moment in which we find ourselves. Maybe, maybe you find yourself strongly identifying with, with one particular side of, of our political machine, the left or the right, and, and you find yourself deeply concerned about the possibility that your side may not win the election. M maybe you don't know how you feel about some of the issues. Maybe you don't know quite where you land, uh, and, and yet you find yourself ridden by anxiety when you think about uh, the political climate in which we find ourselves. 
Maybe you, you peruse Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and the posts or the videos or the ranting or whatever it is uh, increases your heart rate. And, and so you find yourself anxious. Or, or maybe when you think about this environment in which we find ourselves, you're just exhausted. You find yourself just tired. Uh, a couple years ago, there was a, a very large study done called Hidden Tribes. I recommend you look it up. It was a fascinating survey, one of the largest of its kind, that, that basically did a, uh, a wide survey of uh, political leanings of Americans, political views of Americans. And, and there were many interesting findings in here, but one of the most interesting conclusions is that we, we tend to think, and, and certainly this is perpetuated by much of the media, that we live in this uh, extremely polarized nation where either you're really far on the left or you're really far on the right. And what this study found is that we, we certainly do have a group that are on the far left, and we, we certainly do have a group that are on the far right. And, and yet in between, is actually the majority. And, and there's this group in the middle that this study referred to as the exhausted majority, which means that the, the majority of people, at least in this survey, uh, do not identify with the extreme left. They do not identify with the extreme right, but rather find themselves somewhere in between. And, and so maybe, maybe that's you. Maybe you, in thinking or reflecting on the debates that we've seen uh, or on social media posts, you, you find yourself just exhausted. I, I don't know how you enter this election season, this political climate in which we find ourselves. But what I find fascinating is, is how Jesus entered the politically charged culture in which he found himself. Because what we find in this story is that Jesus comes to this whirlwind of politics and tension and, and he enters it as a king. He enters it as one who is in command. It's fascinating. Everything in this story, everything in this story depicts Jesus as a king who is in command. Uh, to begin with, uh, this whole incident of Jesus telling his disciples to go to get a donkey, to bring the donkey back, it's very clear that Jesus had every step of this process planned out. This was not accidental. He knew what he was doing. And he also knew that riding an animal like a donkey into a city like Jerusalem was something that kings do. This was a royal act. And for the Jewish people in particular, it, it would have evoked messianic hopes. Jesus was very, very clearly assuming the posture of the Messiah, of the anointed king. Uh, undoubtedly, Jesus was aware of uh, Zechariah 9.9. Zechariah is this Old Testament book of the Bible, near the very end of the Old Testament. Uh, he was a prophet, uh, and he said these words in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. He said, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Right? Jesus knew exactly what he was doing by having a, his disciples go get a donkey so he could sit on it and ride into the city of Jerusalem. And not only that, but then the disciples put their coats on the ground for the donkey to ride over, something that also had royal connotations 
And, and as he rode on his donkey, his disciples cried out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This is a quote from Psalm 118, which historically uh, the Jewish people would sing uh, as a way of, of referring to their king. It was so very clear what Jesus was doing, what he was saying about himself, how he was entering this politically charged anxiety-ridden environment. Jesus came as king. And, and so you have some, disciples, some uh, Pharisees who were nearby who had a very different perspective on, on the kingdom of God than Jesus. And they're hearing this and they're seeing this. And it's very clear to them that Jesus is being depicted here by himself as Israel's anointed king, as the Messiah, the one through whom God's salvation would come. And, and so they're like, Jesus, stop it. Like, tell your disciples to be quiet. That's not appropriate. What are you suggesting? Who, who are you saying that you are? Right? This is all in the subtext. They, what they see happening is highly inappropriate, even maybe dangerous. And what's Jesus' response? He's like, friends, if, if my disciples are quiet, then these stones will cry out. Right? This, this whole story is this depiction of Jesus entering this, this anxiety-ridden, politically volatile, charged environment. And, and he enters it as a king, as one who is in command. See, Rather than being sucked into any of the power games, any of the different political perspectives or systems on offer in Jesus' day, he enters into this environment utterly self-differentiated, which is a fancy way of saying he refuses to be subsumed into any of the perspectives of his day. He came as king. He would not submit to any of the different philosophies or perspectives of his day. And, and this is clear throughout his entire ministry, right? According to the Sadducees, the kingdom of God would come through toleration of a corrupt empire. But see, Jesus came and he spoke truth to power and he, and he condemned evil and injustice. The Pharisees said that, that God's kingdom would come through strict adherence to external rules and regulations, and they had a very particular vision of what holiness meant. But Jesus came and proclaimed and embodied a vision of the kingdom that said, no, actually, it's about internal heart transformation and a vision of holiness centered upon loving God and loving people. The Essenes advocated for withdrawing from society, disengaging from where the action is in order to pursue a particular vision of purity. But Jesus said, no, actually I'm coming in. I'm drawing near. Disengagement, withdrawal is not the way of the kingdom. And finally, the Zealots came with this vision of the kingdom that they believed would come through violent rebellion with swords. But Jesus came and he preached and embodied a vision of the kingdom that did not come through violent rebellion with swords, but rather through loving forgiveness on a cross. This is the kind of king that Jesus is. And he came as king of kings and lord of lords. And just as he entered into the hyper-charged political climate of his day as king, so too he enters our politically charged cultural moment as king. It is so easy, isn't it, to, to take Jesus and to try to fit him in to our political party or to our political perspective or to our pet ideology. It's so easy to, to make Jesus in our image 
and, and to assume, to assume, well, of course Jesus is a Republican. Well, of course Jesus is a Democrat. And yet, yet if there's anything we learn from this story, it's that Jesus refuses to be domesticated by our own systems, our own ideologies, our own parties. Jesus is king. And he therefore demands that all of our man-made systems bow down to him. I just read a story about someone reflecting on their political journey. And, uh, and this individual said that when he was younger, as a Christian, growing up in a very Christian environment, uh, the very clear and even explicit message that he received was uh, to be a Christian meant to vote Republican. And that was, that was just very clear to him. In, in more recent years, uh, he has found himself in an environment uh, where, where the opposite has become the case. And, and he now finds himself hearing things like, how, how can you possibly be a Christian and vote Republican? Right? See, we, we all have this tendency to, to assume that, of course, of course Jesus thinks the way that I do, votes the way that I do, of Of course, this particular party is closest to the kingdom of God. But here's the reality. There is no political party that perfectly reflects the kingdom of God. Jesus is the only one that we look to who who perfectly embodies the kingdom. And he's the one that invites us in to this kingdom. You know, I, I'll occasionally hear the question, if, if Jesus was alive today, would he be a Republican or a Democrat? Uh, to which my response is usually something like, uh, well, first of all, he is alive today. And, and I can promise you this, that Jesus is neither a Republican nor a Democrat. Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, what none of this means is that we shouldn't therefore vote, or that we shouldn't have convictions, or that we shouldn't engage in the the political system, and, and even have political leanings. And I'll explain why in just a minute, but at the very least what this means is that we should be humbled and chastened by the reality that perhaps things are a little more complicated than we often assume. In, in a New York Times article written by the pastor, uh, former pastor Tim Keller, titled, How Do Christians Fit in the Two-Party System? They Don't. Keller wrote this. It was an article that came out uh, just a couple years ago. He said, The biblical commands to lift up the poor and to defend the rights of the oppressed are moral imperatives for believers. For individual Christians to speak out against egregious violations of these moral requirements is not optional. However, there are many possible ways to help the poor. Should we shrink government and let private capital markets allocate resources? Or should we expand the government and give the state more, more of the power to redistribute wealth? Or is the right path one of the many possibilities in between? The, the Bible does not give exact answers to these questions for every time, place, and culture. Uh, and then in his article, Keller tells this, this helpful story about uh, a gentleman who uh, is from Mississippi who uh, was a Presbyterian, very conservative politically. He was a Republican. Uh, And he went on a trip to the Scottish Highlands. And while there, he he spent time in a a, a Presbyterian church there, an Orthodox Presbyterian church, very conservative. And he was very pleased and felt this unity with this congregation, theologically and spiritually. He felt they were... They were of the same ilk. Uh, in fact, this is a congregation that, that would not watch television on a Sunday. 
And so he, he felt this synergy with them, and, and, and which is why he was then shocked to discover the more time he spent there that, in his view, this congregation, by and large, were socialists. That, that when it came to their, their opinions on uh, government economic policies, they held views that he would label as socialist, and, and yet they did so on the basis of their biblical Christian convictions. Now, when this gentleman went home, he didn't go home less conservative. He didn't have a, a massive paradigm shift, politically speaking. And yet, in his words, he did go home humbled and chastened. Now, let me just clarify something. What all of this means is not that, that as Christians, we, we should not vote. That as Christians, we, we should not engage in politics. What all of this means is not that none of it matters because it's all relative. And well, No, actually, it matters quite a bit. Uh, we, as Christians, live in a cultural context in a nation where we actually have a voice, and that comes with responsibility. And so, as followers of Jesus who are obligated, obligated to love our neighbors, recognizing, when we recognize that the policies that are enacted actually impact people, then that means that these policies matter because that means the way that we vote is a way of loving our neighbors. So it doesn't, none of this means, well, none of it matters whatsoever. I mean, and, and if, if you think that's the case, I mean, it doesn't take much perusing of history to realize why it matters. Consider Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s. 94%, according to some historians, 94% of the German population were professing Christians. And yet, look what happened in that time and in that place. I mean, think about the civil rights movement here in the United States in the 1960s and, and the incredibly positive change that happened within our society, structurally speaking. And so the voice that we have and the impact that we can have on society is very, very important. And yet, what this does mean is that we can never confuse a political party with the kingdom of God. The Democratic Party is not the kingdom of God. The Republican Party is not the kingdom of God. We encounter the kingdom of God in the person of Jesus, in the crucified and risen Lord and Savior of the world who entered Jerusalem as king, a king who would then just one week later give his life for a world that his father loved so much. Here's my hope for this season, both for this teaching series, but also for this election season as a church. My hope is that, is that we would increasingly become a people who keep Jesus and his vision of the kingdom central in our lives, that, that we become a people who together explore what does it mean, even as we occupy different places on the political spectrum, together that we are challenged by this question of how do we let Jesus be the center of orbit in our lives around which everything else orbits? How do we allow Jesus and, and his vision of the kingdom of God to be the center of gravity around which everything else in our lives orbits, including the ways that we think about and engage politics. So, so let me end with this question, and this is a question that I hope carries us through this entire series, and it's this. How might God be inviting you to change the way that you think about and relate to politics? How might God be inviting you to change the way that you think about and relate to politics? Maybe what this means is going from being disengaged to engaged. Maybe what this means is from going to not talking about it 
to anyone, to actually beginning to be open with others. Maybe for you what this means is going from talking about it a lot and passionately to maybe talking less and listening more. Or, or maybe for you, what this might look like is for the first time ever, stopping and reflecting upon some of your political perspectives and asking the question, what does Jesus think about some of these things? What do the scriptures say about some of these things? Maybe, maybe you've never actually connected those dots. But I want to invite us together to be reflecting on this question, how might God want us to change the way that we think about and relate to politics? Jesus enters this, this world of ours, this cultural moment, as king. Let's pursue him together. Will you pray with me? Father, uh, we pause now and we thank you that you, you are king over all creation, that everything within your creation belongs to you. Jesus, we thank you that you have come into this world as king, as the one who holds all authority in heaven and on earth, and that you use that authority to rescue and to renew because you were driven by love. Help us, Jesus, to keep you at the center, especially during a time such as this, a very politically charged time, a time where it's, it's difficult sometimes to have conversations with people or to even be open and honest about our thoughts and feelings. Father, may May this church, Park Church, be a community where, where we can be open and honest and we, where we spur one another on to following your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray and it's in the power of your spirit we pray as well. Amen.
Amen. It is good to know who our king is, and it is good to know that he is a king of love. Thank you again for joining us, for worshiping with us, for listening to what God has to say to us today. A few things I want to remind you about before we go. The first is that we would love for you to join up with one of our community groups. If you don't know what they are, um, go to our website, just parkchurchnj.com slash groups, and you can learn about what they are and get connected that way. We would love to plug you in so that you could be less isolated, more connected, and can actually grow to follow Jesus in this time. Get connected to a group. The other thing I want to say is just, it's just how thankful we are continually for your generosity and for your faithfulness in funding the mission here at Park Church. Thank you. Um, if you want to give for the very first time or to continue to give, it's super easy. Just text PCNJ to 77977. And a link to our online giving platform will bounce back to you. Or you can go to our website, parkchurchnj.com slash give for all sorts of information on how to give and why we give here at Park Church. Thank you again for being with us. Now for a closing word, I'm going to throw it over to Michael. And now a benediction uh, from the end of 2 Thessalonians. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. Go with God.